For now begins the judgment of this world. <laughs> How did you find me? How'd you find us? You sent those emails, didn't you? Who did say it was from? Uh... Mother? Unbelievable. Okay, so if you didn't send them, then who did? We got no idea who Mother is. If she sent you an email, it means whoever she is, she thinks you're one of us. So if Mother thinks I'm one of you, then that means you're all survivors too? Except we all saved ourselves. The hell's that supposed to mean? What she means is, she and I were the first two members of the team. Mother introduced us via email. We figured out our clues, and that's how we met. Jane 3, that's me. And I became Jane 4 after what I'd survived. What the fuck? Red Riding Hoods is a horror podcast by Violet Hour Media. Subscribe for free wherever you listen to podcasts. too much into this endeavor to see it thwarted by a band of Jezebels. Hello, my name is Laura Lee Barr, and I am here talking to David Quiroz Jr., who is the writer, and Sarah Joy Brown, who is the director of Red Riding Hoods, a fantastic podcast on Violet Hour Media. So, I'm just gonna get started with my questions for Sarah and for David. To start with, I really want to know, what are your favorite horror stories? <laughs> you Catch first, it. David. <laughs> you first. first. I will, so my absolute favorite horror movie of all time is Candyman, the original Candyman. I love, I really love the, the uh, remake as well, but uh, the original is just, it feels, it's a slasher movie that is transcendent of its genre with the score and just the connection that Helen has with him. And it's, it's a beautiful, bloody, scary, you know, heartfelt film all at once. And those are the, the movies I like the most are ones where you really, it's not just the thrills of a slash. So it's not just the scares. Uh, there's a human element to it. And every single one of my favorite horror stories, um, a lot of the ones by Guillermo del Toro, uh, especially, you know, tend to have uh, a lot more, uh, a story that they're trying to tell beyond just the, the ghosts that are in it. And that's what really draws me to the genre and the way that these stories communicate with um, our bigger fears beyond just, you know, the boogeyman in front of us. Yeah. Yes, and I, I agree with that. And definitely the way that a horror story connects to what our culture and our society fears and how someone can tell one that makes that plain and clear and transcends, transcends it. Yeah, totally. Sarah? Um, okay, so some of my, my favorite uh, horror films, and I, I have to be really honest, and everyone knew this when I came to the project, I did not come to the project as a horror fan. So I have been transformed. <laughs> I will say that over the last many months that I have been researching and then, you know, working on this from start to finish, I now, every night I watch a horror movie. It's part of my research because we're still working through some of the stuff. Um, and I'm, you know, picking and choosing. And I, I, when I learned about we were going to, to sit down and talk with you, I actually took your questions and I thought, well, let me write down some answers. And as I did that, I realized I actually knew a lot about horror films. I, I had a lot of horror films I really loved and um, that I actually was a fan. So is, is the long story short. I think my, my um, favorite types of horror uh, Alfred Hitchcock is uh, Hitchcock is what I was drawn to as a kid I'll say because my dad was a big fan so that's what we watched when I was growing up he would let us watch this Alfred Hitchcock you know hour 
Um, so I definitely um, come at it from that perspective. And then I would say Friedkin is another one of my favorite directors whose movies I, I still love to watch. Um, Exorcist, I just watched a couple nights ago. And I would say that's one of my very favorite um, horror movies. It still scares the bejesus out of me. And, and I love Alien. Those are, so, you know, a, a story like Alien where it goes into sci-fi is really kind of my uh, kind of horror. Yeah. I love that you brought up um, Alfred Hitchcock. Uh, when I was young, uh, I went to a revival house and we saw um, Vertigo. Mm -hmm. And I think that that had a profound effect on my psyche. It was so scary to me. Um, and, and, I, and as an adult looking now at like the way in which he casts his new girlfriend as, you know, as, as Kim Novak, Kim Novak now versus Kim Novak who he had this um, traumatic thing with. It, it's very creepy, very uh, awesome. Um, and of course, like the exercise I still think is like, the scariest. <laughs> it's terrifying. It's a terrifying movie. Hold up really well. <laughs> Hold up really well. That's what I think. Exactly. Yeah. They really just, they stand to the test of time. Mm -hmm. And even though the special effects in all of the Hitchcock movies were really poorly, I think, constructed at the time that they were made, they were incredible and revolutionary. And you can still look at them through that lens of how it might have felt back then to see, you know, the rear view shot, the, the shot in the rear view um, and all of that. I think nowadays a movie audience looks at that and thinks, oh, that's a little hokey and a little cheesy, but it still gives the required effect. You still get scared. Okay. So um, yeah. So uh, anyway, some of my favorites. And, and, and in terms of as a director, uh, you know, have you seen the director's cut of The Exorcist? I haven't seen it recently. So maybe 15 years. I don't know exactly when it came out, but I'm sure that, um, and I can't say for sure, but I'm. Uh, that's generally something I always seek out. And because I wasn't necessarily a horror fan, I didn't <laughs> seek it out, but I may have seen it. You know, I don't know. I wasn't able to get access to it um, a couple nights ago when I went to watch it. It has some of the most terrifying, I, like they didn't put it, they, there were things in the director's cut they didn't put in the, um, released cut because they were, I, I think, just too terrifying. There are some images in there. There's one where she's doing a crab walk backwards and then she opens her mouth and blood comes out. It's terrifying. It's down, a terrifying walk. Now, yes. She's crawling to uh -huh. crab walk and you're like, oh, that is wrong. And I'm not sure how they got Linda Blair to even do that motion, but um, yes. So, uh, so speaking of um, what we liked as a kid and what we like now, what was really scary to you when you were young um, that isn't scary to you now? And what's really was really scary to you when you were young that is still scary to you right now? David? Sarah, you got to go first this time. Okay, sure. Um, <laughs> you know, this is a very strange answer, but it's the truth. I really thought about it. Uh, Pink Floyd's The Wall, when I was about five Ooh. years old, for whatever reason, my mother put it on and I watched it. And it terrified me, the blood and the milk and the grinding of the children oh over into the hamburger <laughs> meat. It really just, it literally, uh, to this day, I am scarred for life with images in my brain of children being ground into a meat, <laughs> a meat grinder. But, and then the, the blood and the milk, something about that image has always terrified me. And I hope to recreate it at some point, <laughs> you know, sort of yeah. cathartically move through it. But, um, but it doesn't scare me at all anymore. Um, whereas The Exorcist still does. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I think the wall still terrifies me. Actually, <laughs> just that image of like the the mall walking into the grinder is absolutely terrifying. And then the hammer and animation. Yes. Yeah. The, just whoever the characters were in the show traumatized me as a kid. I thought that they were out there and they were going to come and get me, which I can't say that there's any other show except maybe Nightmare on Elm Street where I had that in my mind, where I thought they might come and get me. <laughs> wow. Wow. Interesting. Wow. <laughs> wow. Cool. cool. David? So... For me, something that when I was a child, I mean, like, and I, this tells you a lot about why I turned out the way I did, but like, I grew up on horror movies. I grew up on, you know, with uh, uncles who should not have let me watch Dawn of the Dead when I was six years old or things like that. Um, the 
slasher movies I saw definitely way well before I was prepared mentally for them. But, you know, the idea of like Jason Voorhees, Michael Myers, Leatherface, these things always scared me. Uh, they are the least terrifying things to me now, not because uh, I no longer fear like the physical violence. They're still uh, intimidating in their ability to kill. But if they're the evil you can see and they're the evil that you can you can see it coming, you know, it's coming. It's the person like in uh, Night of Living Dead, you know, uh, the person that you're stuck in a house with that's going to grab the gun from you and you've trusted them the whole time. And now all of a sudden they're shooting you to save themselves or it's, you know, the people, the duplicitous evil, I think is much more terrifying. And it's something that I try to recreate in this podcast, uh, Red Riding Hood, as much as possible, where, you know, there is the skin level horror that we can face and then there's something bigger that we are not prepared for and that's that's what scares me nowadays besides my credit rating and my student loan payments but um <laughs> you know, just used to be used to be guys with knives and masks not anymore the, so so to, so speaking of red riding hoods so how do you feel um and you started to to answer this question how do you feel like this story brings up without, without any spoilers how do you feel like this story brings up um these deep-seated fears and lets um lets you and the audience face them yeah that's a great question um really what it is is you know and the there's no spoilers here where uh you know we start with the red riding Hood with this team uh fighting you know they they're fighting first uh men who are impersonating these famous killers and then they have to start fighting the resurrected killers themselves uh, and the bigger evil behind it, which I won't get into because of spoiler territory, but it does come later in this season. Uh, you start to realize what is behind it. And um, one of the things I wanted to really play with is that every safety net that uh, these victims of a mass murder, you know, the final girls, every safety net that they could have had while well, going to the police, going to their family, going to uh, the governmental institutions, the FBI and, you know, religion, the church, all of these, none of these things can help them. As a matter of fact, some of them are actively working with this greater evil. And that to me was, I wanted to get with that where, you know, the Red Riding Hoods are equipped to handle um, the immediate monster, but it's this the conspiracy behind the monster or the overarching um, network behind them that is much more dangerous and that they're not as of episode three which just came out today um they are not equipped for the bigger one they have to get equipped over the course of uh, the next seven episodes so yeah yeah that's a that's a very powerful um <laughs> that's very powerful and resonates exactly with what you were saying with with the the fear that you can see the, the enemy that you can see versus the enemy that you you can't. Um, I know mm -hmm. that my student loans are really scary too. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so Sarah, what what about you? What does uh, what does Red Riding Hoods um, evoke for you in terms of facing fears and overcoming them? Well, first, I just want to say, David, I I didn't realize that you had that um, sort of through line underneath your work with Red Riding Hoods. And I find it fascinating because it's something that I have said many times in my life, which is that there is, you know, there should be sort of a safety net for victims of mass casualties, of trauma, rape, murder, whatever it is. And there doesn't seem to be, it doesn't matter who you are. If one of these things happens to you and you've seen this with Me Too and all of these other stories, there isn't that safety net. Nobody gets caught. Um, in a, in a sort of safety net where, you know, there's um, a group of people that march in and take care and, and help you through. It's just really not that way when you're a victim. Um, and for me, when I read the show, I felt, I think it's really interesting that we're dealing with mama film and what you said about that sort of maternal side, because I felt in, in intuitively like, oh, I'm the right person to, to direct this because not only am I a super maternal um, figure in a lot of women's lives than my daughter included, but because um, I think that I have a, a particular perspective on being a survivor that, um, and I won't go into any details about it, but just say that I put it in my work and I have, uh, you know, personal experiences and, um, and I try to 
inform everything I do in terms of my work with my personal experiences. And I have personally experienced that lack of sort of safety net for um, the traumas and casualties that you can go through uh, that are similar to what the girls go through. So I was really drawn to that. Um, and I felt kind of protective of the characters, if that makes any sense. Yeah like a big sister or something. Oh, I wish I was their big sister. I would, you know, or I was their mom. I would take care of them. So I thought, well, what a great way to take care of the characters, direct them. Oh, I love that. Oh, really I love how I felt. That. Like, oh, let me give you a big hug. Oh, my girl. And now when I'm editing and stuff and I'm listening over and over for hours at a time to the same voices doing the same jokes for months, I still laugh every time. I know that I've done the right line if I'm still laughing at it. And I feel very protective of the actors as they go through these traumas in the episodes. I literally talk back to it. I'm like, oh, it's okay, Kaylee, you tell him. You tell him. <laughs> Jackie, you get him. Jackie, and I repeat the lines of the characters back. So anyway, I have a very deep bond with these characters that David has created. And I love all of them. I love all the girls. I call them my girls. Oh my gosh. I, 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 I love that. That is so beautiful. And such a, that is such a beautiful take on directing too, you know, to think of yourself instead of as a commander or instead of as, you know, some sort of general or so you're in some sort of ward think of them as like you're their mother like I, I love that Sarah um, but isn't that being a general I mean I'm a mom so I know that <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know they, there is an overlap to that as well you have to be at the head and yet you have to command people in a way that makes them want to do what you're asking them <laughs> to do as well yeah but I think that that is really that is the thing about um motherhood and talking about the mama film and, and directing as, as mothering that like, yes, like being a mother really does mean you're a doctor, you're a teacher, you're a general, you're a bear, you're, you're all of these things, you know, uh, and, and you're still a human being with feelings, which a lot of people forget, <laughs> you know, with your own needs. It, it's, it's a really, that's, it's a very powerful, um, I, I really love that. Um, and, and I was, one of the questions I had for you was about how your experiences as an actor influenced how you directed your actors here. And I would love for you to talk a little bit about that. Um, so it's, I found it to be a very different experience than directing actors in a normal film um, and yet similar in a lot of ways. Um, obviously the actors don't have to do hair and makeup. So all of that is just cut right out. You know, you do, you don't really have rehearsals with the other actors. So as the director, you have to play every other character in the show for the actor to have something to work off of. And so that was really interesting. So you're literally acting and directing at the exact same time um, because you want to give them the very best, right? And, uh, and you want to hear and listen at the same time. And you want to be very careful not to overlap them. So it's it's a complicated process, I will say. It's really, really complicated. We did 11 actors in person and we did another six remotely. So there were quite a lot of it, 17 actors in total, plus myself um, doing credits and so forth. So there was a lot of material and a lot of uh, characters. And, um, and it's really a challenging medium to work in, but so much fun. I, every day of my life, I'll tell you this, I literally walk around going, this is the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. What hardest thing I've ever done? This is the hardest thing I've ever, this is so hard all day, every day. So it's really fun because of that. But yeah, it's very, very challenging. And, um, and as an actor, what I think the best thing I could bring to this was being able to, to read the script and go, oh, I know who would be amazing at this and this and this and this and this. Be able to go through the script and have an idea for 14 of the actors or 15 of them of who I would put in it immediately. And then also knowing how to talk to them, having that shorthand, because we don't have a lot of time to get this stuff. So you really have to do, you know, you do have to have a shorthand with the actors. And also, I think you have to know exactly what you want. Mm -hmm. And so that's easy, I think, when you're an actor and you know exactly what you want. Um, yeah. Also, the the uh, the sound designer, and I don't know if anybody else has ever done this, but the sound designer had me come in for 10 hours and record the entire script. So all 10 episodes of the show so that we would have like a template of how it sounds, you know, what's happening in the scenes and that he would have a sort of template for his work. And in doing that, it gave me the opportunity to, you know, say every line out loud and hear every line out loud before we actually recorded the actors. That is That's awesome. That is awesome. Yeah, totally. Wow. So you recorded the entire thing. 
every character. Yes, ma'am. Oh, wow. ten hours. <laughs> Did you do different voices for them? I did. I mean, it was, it was, it's really interesting if you ever listen back to it, because I'm trying to do in some scenes, you know, 10 voices, 10 different actors, and I screw up the accents and it gets all crazy, but <laughs> thankfully it's not for showcase. It'll probably, a little bit of it'll end up in the bloopers at the very most. I was going to say, when do we get to hear this? That's what <laughs> you I'm... get to hear it only. That's it. Only for you, David. Deal. <laughs> only for you. Wow. And I didn't want to exclude David because I know David is, a, are you a single dad or your father? I know that. And I, I am a father. I'm, ma I'm married. I uh, have a wonderful wife and uh, she's a great mother, but uh, we have an 11 year old daughter and nine year old son. And you wrote this partly based on your want to give your daughter um, positive role models in the horror genre. Is that correct? Absolutely. She is very much my mini me. She loves horror. She's actually writing a story, a book right now about a witch. And, you know, I've explained to her the whole concept of, you know, what's really a way, like, you know, make sure it's not just, you know, accusations of witchcraft versus, you know, empowerment. And, right. Um, just somebody who's feared because they're an outsider or an other. Um, but realist, it, what it was, was it's thinking about the world that my daughter is growing up in. And I know, Sarah, your daughter is off to college, graduated college, right, just recently. And so the same thing of these, the young adults or in my, in my case, you know, a preteen who is entering this world and just the world that we see and that we know. And it's like, have we prepared them well enough? And what lessons, these ghost stories that we grew up with were always lessons. They were, you know, red, Little Red Riding Hood, don't get off the path or a wolf's going to eat you, things like that. It's like, have we prepared them enough to handle the wolves in this world? And, you know, that one of the many, many, many little bottle rockets that went off my mind uh, as I was developing this. So, so, so of the fairy tales, I, you know, I love fairy tales. They're my first real horror stories. Um, why is, is this why Red, White, Red Riding Hoods is the, is the inspiration? Absolutely. Um, there have been a couple of other adaptations or media that was inspired by uh, the tale of Little Red Riding Hood that I really gravitate towards. Uh, the first one was uh, Reese Witherspoon's first feature. It was called Freeway with Kiefer okay. Sutherland, where very much a modern retelling of, you know, a, cre a serial killer who picks up a hitchhiker and what happens with that. Uh, there was a video game called The Path that was highly, hugely influential on me as uh, the, is an independent video game where basically you played three sisters and each sister, the quest was mother gives you the basket and says, take these to grandmother's house and don't get off the path. And if you stay on the path, the game's over. It takes like 30 seconds. But of course, that's not the interesting part. The interesting part is getting off the path. And then each sister encounters her own version of a wolf, whether it be abusive uh, boyfriends or, you know, things that that these experiences they have to go through to grow and to be otherwise the game is super short. And that always really fascinated me is, you know, that it's a, it's a great story itself, Little Red Riding Hood, because there's so many different versions of it. And, you know, the one that I always heard was uh, there's a woodsman who shows up and kills the wolf and saves Little Red Riding Hood. And then when I got older, I realized that version came later that in the original version, it's there's nobody to save her. And looking at how these stories evolve, because, you know, it goes, goes from this medieval uh, sort of fable to try to get, you know, young girls to obey their mothers um, and stay away from the wolves to, okay, that's kind of brutal that you're going to get eaten. So don't worry, there's going to be a man that comes and rescues you at some point, you know, and then you'll get a second chance. And this time you better listen. Um, the way that that story evolved and the way that it serves as that parable, I thought was really fascinating. And um, once I started thinking about this idea of the final girl's hunting monsters proactively it just naturally it fit like right away and then once I realized that it the rest of it just took off wow yeah um so so two two things I want to ask one uh first of all the idea of the path right stay on the path be on the path um and how do you feel like that is echoed in Red Riding Hoods of, you know what, maybe get off the path, <laughs> go, go beyond the path. You can like look, look somewhere else besides what you've been told. Um, can you talk a little bit about that concept of the path? Yeah. And that's something that I kind of, 
you know, we went back and forth and I know Sarah uh, and then Cassie, who's the exec producer, uh, we all had a conversation about this earlier where uh, at one point in the script, it became like a contradictory message where there's talking about, do we stay on the path or get off the path? Does mother want us on the path or off the path and which one's ideal? And so I think it comes down to what I tried to do is uh, the level of trust that they have with each other and with who is this mother character, which I won't spoil, um, you know, do they have the right intentions for us and should we really trust them or are they being duplicitous? You know, since everybody else has lied to us up to this point, how can we really trust that? And the concept of what the path is, is as I, you know, I'm, I'm at that age in my life where I'm starting to get into all these existential uh, ponderings of, you know, where, what, what is the point and what are we doing? And, you know, what path did, I, should I have, at what point did the path fork for me of my life and professional life and family life and uh, creative life and everything else. And I think for these, since all of the characters in the Red Riding Hoods have encountered um, a horrifying event in their lives, that starts a new path for them. And it's, if I had never had this happen to me, what was the path that I had been on versus this path that I'm now, that's been thrust upon me. And is there a way to ever cross back over and have a normal life again? And it's sort of, we don't really get into it in this season, you know, knock on wood that there's uh, other seasons that we can really get into that, that concept of, you know, I regret that I chose this path because uh, it is in a lot of ways heroic and it, it leads to growth for them, but it's also going to, it's very difficult and it gets more difficult. And I really wanted to explore that with this uh, TV show. And I think, you know, Sarah's just, God, she's brought these characters to life so well. And just the way that they're growing over the course of three episodes so far, you know, just, um, how much fun it is, how much fun it is uh, to spend this time with them to see them uh, really grow into these roles and everything. It's just been awesome. So the path that she's got them on is perfect. And I'm really excited to see uh, the conclusion of this. <laughs> yeah, uh, Sarah, you, you did an excellent, excellent job with these vocal performances. I mean, just the, that you directed incredible vocal performances, which is, you know, for a podcast for, you know, what, what the medium is, it just, just slam dunk. Way to go. It was fantastic. Thank you. First of all, thank you. And David, like I literally, uh, th my goal here was that David would be pleased and Cassie would be pleased a, and then B that the actors would be happy. And I have to say that, gosh, they made it easy. You know, they, it was, it's difficult work because you're every scene is green screen. Basically, if you think about, about it like that, yeah, so what we've seen is green screen and you really have to give them something and they have to come with something, especially when you have 10 episodes. Um, so it's really important that you cast actors that you believe in and that you know you can get them there in a short period of time and that they can do it again and again and again and again. And I found that every person I hired just exceeded um, that we hired, I, I take that back, excuse me, that just exceeded my expectations of what they would be capable of doing in terms of, like you said, that arc and that growth, that the characters have to go through a 10 episode arc that we're going to shoot in kind of a shorter period of time than you might expect. And how do we make sure that for each episode, it seems like they're going through these changes of being you know, upset and then exhausted and then pulling through it and then getting stronger and that the next show, there's just a little more confidence and a little bit more, you know, don't honk at me kind of attitude. And, and little by little, you start getting these badass girls going, hey, over here, da da da, telling the FBI and whatever, you know, just a, it's a completely different show by episode, I think five as to what the girls start with in episode one. And that is David. He wrote that in there. And then that's making sure that the actors respect it and that we we check it off our list. Make sure this is really important more than anything else, that the characters grow, that they don't stop ever growing from episode to episode, that we can actually hear them kind of growing up and getting more and more confident in what they're doing, which is proactively attacking and seeking out monsters, like you said, David, and they're they're chasing serial killers, essentially. And, yeah. and, and can you tell me, Sarah, just a little bit um, in terms of speaking of like the path and the story of Red Riding Hood is staying on the path and where the path leads. It seems like, you know, coming to horror as a genre and coming, you know, to this project has this, do you feel like you're on a different path? Is it like, you know, are you on a different path or you, did you go into the woods? You're coming back, you know, like, how does that feel in your life? 
Great analogy. I love it. I definitely feel like I'm in the woods. Uh, it's a great analogy. I really like to be that that artist that is right on the edge, walking a tightrope. That's where I'm comfortable. That's where I live. That's where I thrive, in fact. And I dislike more than anything getting comfortable. So when I'm comfortable, I'm like, okay, I'm bored now. Let's do something else. So this show, just from beginning to now, what I loved about it was being not quite ready for it. You know, just like, oh my God, am I ready for this? I don't know. I'm going to jump in and see. So I love that. I thrive in that place. And I will say that, you know, the path for me um, has me driving down really dark roads in the middle of the night, listening at full volume to a horror podcast, you know, which is not something I necessarily would have imagined a year ago, but I'm creeped out when I listen back to the show in the dark. Yeah. I like lonely road. And that really excites me. That makes, um, it just makes me want to go home and park the car and get back into it and, you know, do another one. Let me get right in there. And um, so what's exciting to me about this, this process is it's so different from what I've done throughout my life as an actor, but it's, but it's using that skill that I learned um, as an actor. So I'm not throwing away everything I learned. I'm actually able to incorporate it and it helps to make me a better director. Um, So I love this, this path has been, um, incredibly challenging. And that's what I love the most about it is that I, I don't know what's going to happen from minute to minute and I'm, and I'm learning. So that's, and I think that, you know, one thing I've said about actors, all, uh, not just actors, but all artists. And I believe this is true. When you get to a certain level of success, it's really easy to get comfortable. And I think that when we get really comfortable, our work just isn't our best. So, and I, for myself anyway, I feel that when I'm a little uncomfortable, a little bit scared, a little bit, not sure if I'm out of my league, I'm doing my best work because I'm afraid to be shown up by anybody else. So that's where I'm at in this path. And um, I I hadn't anticipated it, but I really love it. I've really, really, really enjoyed this. So, and also I've been editing 20 years, but this is my first editing, um, audio editing. And it is so challenging and so, so much fun. It's just really fun and hard. Wow. I I love that. And I I do agree that um, as artists, it's really important to not get um, comfortable. Because, uh, you know, uh, if you're comfortable, you're not doing it right. Because <laughs> art should, art, art's hard. It's hard. <laughs> it's hard. It's right. Okay, so I feel, it doesn't Very feel hard. so bad. Thank you. It's, hard. Hard. <laughs> it's harder. Yeah, it's like one of those things like, you know, you can watch somebody doing great ballet dancing and it looks easy, but, but uh, it should look easy, but uh, it's not. There's nothing easy about it. That's right. Um, so just... Uh, to kind of bring everything back to, you know, in the sort of concluding remarks, I want to talk a little bit about the concept of um, the final girl. And this was a uh, term coined by a a scholar who watched, you know, 200 slasher movies. And um, she talked about how um, the basically you started off identifying Oh, da- oh, you have it. Oh, so, I, so David, David ex- 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 tell us, tell us about, tell us about this book. <laughs> right. Oh, it's an, it's an incredible book. It's one of my favorite. Um, it's an, it's definitely academia and a lot of times those books can be very dry, um, but it is very, it's a very great read. Uh, she basically breaks down a lot of the uh, tropes of how this came to be based on a lot of uh, underneath, it's still very much the male gaze because a lot of these movies, most of these movies were written by uh, men and it was sort of like this masculinized uh, female character that it manages to survive because she is the least feminine in the group. And a lot of times uh, based on in the 70s and 80s, uh, you know, this sort of like the rise of Reaganism and um, puritanical standards being reimposed. And so it was like punishment of the other of the rest of the group, but the pure one, the one who didn't partake in any of these like drugs and sex and things like that was the one who managed to survive and uh, it's been kind of taken by like movies like scream and things like that like uh broke it down in a way that was a little bit more meta but uh she did a really the author is uh carol carol clover and she did a really great job of um going through all these movies and sort of the genesis of it through the 70s um i think she points back all the way uh, and Laura, you may have read it more recently than me. And so it's, it has been, it's in my collection, but it's been a while since uh, I had a chance to read it. But what was the first example that she points at? Do you remember? No. Okay. Well, she was wait, there quite a hold while. on, hold on. No, 
hold on. Well, let's not, it'll be like five minutes. <laughs> My brain going like this, click, click now. Um, uh, but the idea of, yes, the final person who survives and it starts off, you're with the identification of the killer and then you end up identifying with the, the final girl. So your point of view begins and uh, like Black Christmas was one of her, um, the examples of that where you're actually literally in the point of view of the killer, you mm. know, um, and then you end up like identifying with the, the one who survives. Mm -hmm. um, and by the way, she's, uh, she was a professor of, I'm sure she's retired now, of medieval, medieval culture and American film, I think it is, which I think is a really hilarious, beautiful pairing of medieval <laughs> and American film. Um, yeah, they, sure. There's something about those, uh, those um, deep seated archetypes that like just are hardwired in. Back. Um, so in terms of the concept of the final girl, and it's this lone woman victim out, you know, against the monster and finally she'll, you know, have a um, retribution against the monster or, you know, but it, it may not last, like they're, like they're still out there. Mm -hmm. uh, what I'm interested in is how you have taken that idea of the final girl and you've really done something incredibly cool, which is it's not one lone victim out there but all of a sudden there's like this troop of, you know, badass ladies who are out there as a, as a group, like as, and have a community and have in each other. And so um, as a sort of um, send off for our, our, our interview, I would love for you to talk about um, women working together uh, as a final girl <laughs> troop in Red Riding Hoods. Uh, Sarah, did you want to go first? No, I mean, please, you created these characters, and I think that's a really good question for you. Okay, um, yeah, I'd be happy to answer that. So for me, it was the idea of uh, a tragedy, and that's essentially, even though these movies are entertainment, and they're scintillating and um, scintillating, and, you know, we watch them for the excess, for the gruesome violence, for these things that happen to the characters. Uh, one thing that I never saw addressed was what somebody who experiences this is going to deal with afterwards, the fallout of it. Um, and anybody who has survived any kind of uh, horrific situation, uh, we know that, you know, nobody that you try to talk to about this understands, no matter how much they want to, and no matter how well-intentioned they may be, um, you will never find anybody who can support you, who can relate to what you've experienced until you find somebody else who has gone through something similar. Um, and hopefully not the same thing, but you know, somebody who can understand you on that level. And I always thought to myself, um, you know, I don't want to get too into uh, personal details and things like that, but you know, uh, things that we face are something that no if you're trying to explain it to somebody else and sometimes they think that you're lying or they think that you're being dramatic or they think that, you know, all these things. And so I just thought to myself, like, you know, my grew up once again on those 80s slasher movies uh, and the final girls and those ones, my favorite being uh, Ginny and Chris, Chris was in part three, who I named Chrissy in episode one of the Red Riding Hoods after. And so that was my big homage. Um, but, you know, it's like they, the movie ends and you never see them again. And I just thought, like, wouldn't they seek out somebody who could, nobody else could uh, understand what they've been to. So wouldn't they seek each other out and try to, you know, what can we do? And the fact that there are others means that there are still more atrocities to be committed. There's still more monsters to come. And so uh, having fought evil, I don't think that any of them could possibly let it stand. It could just go back to a nine to five or, you know, just ignore it and say that's somebody else's problem. I think they've made it their own and, you know, they want to, a recurring theme in this podcast series is that, uh, and they say it in episode three that just came out today was, you know, when Elisa tells her sister, Kate, we want to make sure nobody else experiences that nobody else has to go through this again. And I don't want to spoil anything, but that gets turned on its head later in the season when it, the whole thing is everybody is trying to stop this from happening again. It's just that their methods are a little bit different and their intentions for doing so are a little bit different. And so, um, you know, that's one of my favorite uh, things for that. And just made sense that the final girls would uh, bond together and help each other out like that. Yeah. Sarah, what do you 
do you think about this idea of, you know, final girls as opposed to final girl? I think that it's beautiful that you created this um, sort of a team of, you know, women who've sur survived tragedy and that they do find a sisterhood that that holds them um, together. And I think that part of what the girls might be struggling with if you're a final girl is is coming apart. So by um, sticking together in this really small environment, in this van and traveling across the country, there's something cathartic about that, I think, for the girls. And I would think um, that allows them to deal with that trauma, sort of um, gives them time to deal with it, people to deal with it uh, constantly near them. So they're they don't really talk about it. You know, it's just an interesting thing. They're all these, they all have had the same experience and they briefly sort of discuss it with each other. But other than that, they do the business at hand, which is not being a final girl. It's making sure nobody else ends up as a final girl. So I think it's interesting that, you know, maybe if they had gone off their own separate ways, they would be in depression and, you know, um, wanting to, do all kinds of, you know, crazy drugs or whatever else, but because of their bond and because of finding each other and their shared um, interest in figuring out who mother is, I think it keeps them, if you will, on the right path. You know, they don't end up as heroin addicts or, you know, killing themselves, which I think, you know, David, you said, what happens to girls after this kind of thing happens? What happens to any human being after something like this happens? So I think what's interesting is that they come together, they're all the final girls, and they just, they don't occupy that title anymore. You know, they become, um, uh, the vigilante process, I think, changes them into something else. Um, and I don't want to say survivor because I don't, I don't think of the girls like that. Once they get through that first couple episodes, I don't think of them as survivors anymore. Strangely, I think of them as being very powerful. And then maybe Absolutely. it's because, yeah, they overcome this uh, survivor mentality and they become powerful beings that are choosing this destiny for themselves. They haven't been thrown into it anymore. So maybe that's yeah. part of it. You know, they get control. They get their, their power back by doing this. Yeah. Yeah, that they gain through through this journey, they gain their own efficacy, they gain their own ability to determine their destiny. Right. Which I think is the, you know, the thing about being a victim is it's that your destiny or your future feels taken from you. And then being able to um, come back and, and use that to, to create your destiny again. That's a, a very powerful um, narrative. That I think we need. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, Laura, that's actually really good. I mean, you definitely phrased that perfectly. Like that's exactly what we're going for. And so I just, um, so I want to thank you both for talking with me. Um, I want to thank uh, Mama Film. I want to thank Violent Hour Media. And um, this is a a wonderful podcast. And I'm so thrilled and honored to get to to talk to you both. And um, and I hope you have a wonderful, uh, Halloween and I wish all the success in the world on this podcast. So, yeah, and when I say wonderful Halloween, this is like, you know, Halloween's my Christmas. So. <laughs> Thank you, Laura, so much. It's like you saying Merry Christmas. But. <laughs> Thank Absolutely. you so much for doing this with us. I really appreciate it. It was so lovely to meet you and talk with you. And David, always great to see you and talk with you. Absolutely.